Thank you. Yeah, I'm the CEO of Vantage Point, and Vantage Point does engineering and consulting work uh, primarily for rural carriers, and that's, uh, I think, why they asked me to speak on this topic. And of course, 5G will have a presence in rural areas, but it's going to be different. And I'm going to explain a little bit why. We, uh, here in the United States, about 40% of the land mass is actually served by small rural carriers, typically cooperatives or small privately held companies, about 40%. There's also about two thirds of it of the US is served by rural electric companies. And so both of them are in the process of deploying uh, broadband uh, throughout the the U.S. in these very rural, remote areas. At Vantage Point, we do both uh, engineering for both wireless and wireline. So we see both sides of it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how it might be a little bit different in the uh, rural area when we're talking about 5G. So as we've already heard, you know, there's right now lots going on in the industry with 5G. Um, I call it the hype phase. You know, right now you can see there's quotes out there that's going to be as revolutionary as electricity and, you know, things like that. But the reality is there's three things. We've already heard several of them talked about this morning, but there's three things that we're trying to accomplish. And it's no different in what we're doing in the urban areas as what we're trying to do in the rural areas, but more bandwidth. Every time we add a G, we want more speed, more bandwidth to individuals, enabling IoT, you know, the Internet of Things, making it more scalable for massive numbers of devices that it's going to serve, and also mission critical applications, which is critical for latency and reliability and already some of the things that we've talked about. Um, if you're interested, I do a lot of work from the regulatory perspective as well, filing things with the FCC. This is the paper I. Uh, filed not too long ago with the FCC, kind of trying to balance for them the technology and what does 5G really mean. A lot of times the regulators get a little confused on the technology piece. I'm actually, although I'm the CEO of Vantage Point, I'm also an electrical engineer and a professional engineer. And so I spend a lot of my time uh, you know, on the technical sides as well. So if you kind of look, and I broke it down a little bit here, when we come to the increase in bandwidth, um, you know, the spectral efficiencies and things like that, a lot of the promise of 5G, I'm going to argue here, is for the urban areas. It's going to help the rural areas, but it's much more prevalent and going to be much more beneficial when we hit the urban areas rather than the rural areas. So if we look at the spectrum right now, and part of the reason is uh, where the spectrum is located that a lot of the 5G is going to take place. These are the different bands that are being targeted for 5G. When we talk about millimeter wave, at least here in the United States, these are the bands that we're talking about um, for millimeter wave that we're really looking at for 5G. When we talk about mid band, this is what we're talking about. So typically the two and a half to five gigahertz bands is typically what we're talking about with mid band. And the reality is if you want to get more speed, and this is true for any wireless, not just 5G, one of the key ways to do it is more spectrum. That's your prime real estate. That's how you get it through. And to give you an idea of how much is available in these bands, I drew this out graphically so that we could kind of see from a scale perspective how much spectrum really is available so you can get an idea of what kind of capacity um, should be uh, achievable through some sort of a wireless technology. So the low band I showed first of all, now the mid band from my previous slide, you can see the different spectrum. So if you go down all the way down to the five gigahertz down below here, um, but you can see some of the things that we're talking about, lots of press lately and what's going on in the three and a half uh, gig band, um, you can see there's still, although there are a fair amount of spectrum, 150 megahertz or so, um, it's still kind of small in the grand scheme of things when you compare it to what's available when we're talking about millimeter wave. So this is all to scale again. So you can see when we're getting up to 
you know, the 39 gigahertz or 60 gigahertz or things like that, a lot of spectrum available. And so when we're talking about these super high speeds that are going to be achieved through 5G, a lot of times we're talking about what's going to happen up there. So the real question is, is that really applicable to these rural markets? And to understand that, I've drawn a little graphic for you here that shows, you know, the low frequencies and again, kind of to scale. The low frequencies have a lot more range, a lot better penetration power when you compare them to the, the higher frequencies, but they also have lower throughput. As you saw in the previous diagram, there's just not as much spectrum available there. When you get into the high frequencies though, the high frequencies, although you've got lots more capacity, a lot more throughput, less range, less penetration power, these are going to be key when you look at um, you know, how applicable it is to the rural areas. Last weekend was the opening season in South Dakota for pheasant season. It's big business in South Dakota. So I'm gonna use a shotgun analogy for you here. <laughs> so over here on the right hand side where you see the little BBs there, that's like the high frequency. Every BB is a little piece of information. If you pack all those in your shotgun shell and shoot it, you're gonna get a lot of information out there but it's really not going to go through hardly anything. You'll probably bounce right off the bird. <laughs> Down here, if you put just one shot in that shotgun shell, that thing's going to go all the way through your barn. But it's only got one piece of information. So that's kind of the analogy when you think of frequencies. When we're at the low frequency, not much, through, not much information but it's gonna go through a lot of things and travel a long ways. Not so with these little BBs up here. The three and a half gigahertz band we're talking about is somewhere over here towards the right hand side. And all things being equal, and every band has little differences when it comes to power and things like that, but all things being equal, I kind of drew it out kind of what you would expect for the various frequency bands that we typically use um, in wireless. So if you look way over here on the far right hand side, and this is a typical rural area, those little squares, those aren't city blocks, those are square miles. And if you look way over here, the yellow, that's the 700 megahertz, so that'd be the 600 megahertz, 700 megahertz, kind of the coverage you might expect. And you get up to the 850s and you know, you're working your way up to the PCS and the two and a half gigahertz and the three and a half, and we get you know, down here on the inside where, you know, this is the 3.65 lightly licensed and all the way down here, 5.8 gigahertz. You can see it's shrinking. Um, you know, free space loss kind of kicks in as you get into those higher frequencies. You know, it's the distance over wavelength uh, squared. And so when you get up into the higher frequencies then, I drew out, if you're in the millimeter wave, those are, a, those are 10 little circles down here where it says 0 .03 square miles. So some of the things when we're talking about millimeter wave, although it's gonna be great in cer certain applications, you're still talking about you know, just a few hundred feet typically that you're going to be able to go. Um, CBRS is kind of bridges some of that, you know, when we're down in the three and a half gigahertz band, uh, bridges some of the distance versus the uh, throughput issues, you know, mid-band, where I've got a couple of slides coming up on the three and a half gigahertz and what's going to be available there and how that could potentially happen. Uh, the higher frequencies are also better when it comes to the beam forming and some of the uh, sophisticated things that you can do with 5G that you couldn't do before. Um, right here is a quote from the Verizon Executive VP and he says, the lower the spectrum, the more 5G will approximate a good 4G network. And uh, that's kind of the reality of the way it's gonna be. Although we will get, you know, we're actually overlaying some of the 5G capabilities into the 4G network today, but um, that's probably a lot of truth in that statement. And since we do at Vantage Point both wireless and wireline engineering, I have my, my wireless guys and my wireline guys you know, arguing all the time about which is the, the right technology to use and which is the best one to use. It's just two different tools in the toolbox and sometimes one is better and sometimes the other is better. But if you look especially in these rural areas when you're talking about 5G, it's, it's 
everything's really becoming fiber with time. And I make this analogy a lot where fiber to the home, you run fiber to the side of the house and you're doing Wi-Fi typically inside the home. So the last 100 or 200 feet inside the home is wireless, it's fiber to that point. When we're talking about millimeter wave 5G, where I'm probably going to the city block with fiber and then the last five or 600 feet might be wireless, it really doesn't look that different anymore. We're arguing over a couple hundred feet anymore. And so if you look at it that way and say, well, I'm gonna run fiber to that last pedestal anyway to serve that city block, and now my choice becomes, do I put fiber then from then into the home, or do I just do wireless from that point into the house, and what really is more cost effective? Um, Oftentimes, depending upon how the, you know, the economics sometimes skew it towards the fiber, a lot of it is construction costs, which is more expensive, but a lot of times you can put the fiber in the home less expensively than you can put that little wireless tower up there and serve them on a 5G basis. Now, if you extrapolate that out, because this one access point here is, is the cost is shared amongst all those eight homes in this example, if you're in a rural area and you're only serving you know, within 500 or 600 or 1,000 feet, you might be getting one farmer. We laid out one exchange in Montana, it was Circle Montana. Um, it was 2,200 square miles, this one exchange, and it averaged 0.17 subscribers per square mile. That's an extreme example, but in a situation like that, everybody would have their own wireless tower. If you, uh, Again, it's wireless becomes fiber with antennas hanging off of it. And that's kind of the way the networks are converging. And uh, there was a recent article, Doug Dawson, who writes Pots and Pans, said millimeter wave 5G is fiber to the curb. And it really is. There's a lot of parallels there. Um, you know, and if you look at some of the, you know, the, the 5G deployments or the carriers now, you know, they're making statements, you know, here's T-Mobile, it says it will never materially scale beyond small pockets of 5G hotspots in, de in dense urban environments. And so, talking about, you know, where 5G really does make sense. You know, mid-band spectrum, they believe, and obviously he's coming from it from the, the Sprint T-Mobile perspective where they've got a lot of uh, spectrum in the mid-band, and he believes it's key, and it probably in rural areas will have a real advantage. I wanted to mention a couple of things that are happening um, that I think is going to help uh, 5G when it comes to rural applications. If you go back to my analogy where, you know, it's, it's the lower frequencies really that are going to help when it comes to a 5G deployment. Um, you know, the CBRS auction is coming up in the U.S. here, the part um, 90. Uh, moving to part, part 96, and it's uh, general availability use. It's going to be higher power than what we normally had in the part 90 when we go to 96. It's 150 megahertz, 70 of it is going to be licensed, and 80 of it is uh, going to be, uh, you know, GAA, remain GAA. Um, so 150 megahertz. Pretty decent mid-band spectrum. I think there's going to be a lot of attention when it comes to um, you know that auction. It's going to be targeted for mid next year. Got a lot of clients. We actually do bidding for our clients, and they uh, lots of interest in that right now. Small companies actually, which like I said, this a lot of our clients are the small small telephone companies and small cable providers. Um, they actually have some fairly significant bidding credits, and maybe you guys would as well. Another thing that's happening that I wanted to mention, um, if you follow what's going on at the FCC, um, and you know, all countries have you know, all these satellite dishes that you know, receive geostationary satellite downlinks in the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band, the, um, C, the American Cable Association has really been driving this, the ACA, and Charter and some of the others have been promoting what they call a 5G plus plan. And if you haven't taken a look at that, you know, there's quite a bit filed with the FCC. I'm about ready to file some stuff myself this coming week 
uh, weighing in on the 5G Plus plan. It's an interesting plan. Um, we're basically what they're arguing is all of these satellite downlinks for these Earth stations is a waste of prime spectrum. So what I had just talked about um, in the CBRS band, you know, that's 3.55 to 3.7 gigahertz. This is really the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band. And they're basically saying about 370 megahertz of that of the 500 total megahertz is just satellite downlink and you don't really need that for satellite downlink anymore. What they really should do is repurpose that for 5G. It's getting some traction in um, DC, so it may actually happen. They believe that they're gonna, could potentially get up to about $37 billion if they would auction off that 370 megahertz of spectrum. What they would then do with that uh, $37 billion is take probably six to eight billion, connect all the ground stations with a fiber network, and so you could abandon all of these satellite dishes because you've repurposed all the spectrum. So that you know you'd still, and then there would be a couple billion. You have to give the satellite guys because they have to relaunch, you know, a few satellites and stuff. But still, you'd end up with twenty-five to thirty billion dollars left over when it's all said and done. So there seems to be a fair amount of traction. And if you're interested, that's something worth uh, taking a look at. It's going to take a four hundred and twenty thousand mile fiber network here in the continental U.S. Um, to be able to achieve it. They believe about 120,000 or so of that is going to be new construction and they want it all complete in five years. This is what it looks like from that mid-band perspective just to show you. There's a 3.55 to 3.7 um, gigahertz band. That's the CBRS. That's what's going to happen there. What I was just talking about, that 5G plus plan, is right there. It's the 3.7 to 4.07. So they would still leave from 4.07 to 4.2 <laughs> for the non-broadcast satellite purposes because those geostationary satellites are used for more than just that, as you can see over here, but the lion's share of it is the, are those uh, satellite broadcast services. So, so a couple of closing thoughts. So the, you know, the laws of physics and the laws of economics you know, are working against 5G in the rural areas, especially when we talk about 5G in the millimeter you know, wave band, which typically when we're talking about these super gigabit speeds and stuff usually would imply that it's in the millimeter wave and the laws of physics are working against that. The densification is going to make more sense in urban areas than in rural areas because you can't afford to have every farmer have their own tower. Um, you know, it'll eventually filter down to the smaller communities but probably not out to that farm. Um, high frequency, shorter reach uh, spectrum doesn't work well in areas where there's huge distances between customers like we have here. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, the urban and the you know, rural networks are going to be largely based on fiber. And we've heard that from multiple of the you know, speakers already today is you know, they're all becoming primarily fiber networks with a little bit of wireless on the end. Thank you for your time.